Bob, in physicists' efforts to understand what reality is all about, the concept of symmetry seems to come up often in their search. What does that mean? Does it mean the same thing we think about in the world when ordinary people talk about symmetry? Sure. It means exactly the same thing. An example of symmetry is roundness of a baseball. Okay. Now, what's so important about symmetry? Well, it's a very practical thing. It's quite simple, actually. You're trying to figure out what the rules are of something, let's say, the vacuum of space-time, with marginal experiments. So you need clues. And when you find regularities in something that might be analogous to the roundness of a ball, then you can hang your hat on them and, and make educated guesses about what's right and what's wrong in your experiments. And these are very good, good lights for guiding you towards, mm. towards deciphering experiments. In fact, they've been so useful in the past that people just love them. And how are they expressed? I mean, when you, what do you see when you're dealing with experiments that, that you can use symmetry? What are the kinds of things? Are they equations? Are they data? How do you get symmetry? Well, that might force me to get a little detail <laughs> to, to explain that. But let's say a perfect example is the, from chemistry. The benzene molecule is a ring, mm -hmm. six-fold ring, mm -hmm. okay? It's a symmetrical idea. Mm -hmm. Now, there were experiments back in the 19th century that figured this out, okay? And once you figured out that, that it had this symmetry, then a new kind of chemical bond that nobody had ever thought of before became the idea, okay? Mm -hmm. But, but you, needed, you needed a clue. You needed a clue about what the shape was in order to figure out a new piece of the puzzle. And so because you have incomplete information, the, the hint of symmetry points you in a certain direction. That's it, exactly. If you knew the answer, you wouldn't need the hint. You just, you'd write down the equations, and then the equations have these properties, and symmetry is one of them, and that's the end. Yeah. Okay. But if you don't have the full equation, then you you're stuck. Symmetry. And boy, when you see one of those symmetries, you get very, very happy. Ah, now I've got them, you know. <laughs> It's happened to me many and many a time. Those are probably one of the great experiences of science when you when you feel that and you know you're you you're you're onto the way. That's correct. The the the, the idea that flashes through your mind is gotcha. <laughs> but symmetry doesn't cause things. Symmetry is a consequence of things. For example, a ball is round. When you turn the ball, it has the same form when you turn it. That's how you're defining the That's symmetry. That's what symmetry means. It means okay. you do a motion of it and it's the same. Okay. Now, the roundness didn't cause the ball. The ball caused roundness. Mm -hmm. Okay. Similarly, if I have a starfish out, okay, and I rotate a starfish, it's itself. But the, the five five legness of a starfish doesn't cause the starfish to exist. Mm -hmm. It's a consequence of starfish uh -huh. Uh -huh. behavior. Now that's a different kind of symmetry because the, the ball, you, 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 you can rotate it any, any way and then you can stop at any point and it's s symmetrical, whereas the starfish, you have to rotate it a fifth exactly. Right. Well, in the jargon of symmetry, that's a detail. Okay. One, we talk about discrete symmetry, the other is continuous symmetry, but they're basically the same okay. thing. All right. So how does that then help us to discern physical law? If you, you have incomplete information, but you can then use the, 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 the apparent symmetry to, to fill in the gaps? Right. You have more than one possibility for what the rule might be, mm -hmm. but one of them uh, has this symmetry property and another one doesn't, so you can reject one of them even though you haven't actually measured that it's the wrong one. Hmm. Now this gives you a, a probability, it, it does it, or does it always have to be that way? Does everything have to be symmetrical? I hear about broken symmetries. Well, what is that? Well, those, the, you're mixing apples and oranges <laughs> there. No, the world doesn't have to be symmetric, but fortunately it is a lot. And the reason for that is when things self-organize, most of the time they do so simply. And so they have a lot of simplicity 
that, that you wouldn't ordinarily expect. And that simplicity is what the symmetry really is. It's a, it's a special property that's not obvious. And almost always that property comes about because of self-organization. Uh, some people like to say that, that, um, that it's fundamental and that and that that's just that's just the way it is but the examples i know of it's not and that's a search for simplicity of which sy symmetry is a an example of or a way of achieving simplicity which is the which which is which which is the more fundamental it's, it's, simplicity or the symmetry they're symmetry? they're part and parcel of the same thing when things get simple uh, which, which, as I've explained, you know, we don't completely understand why they do this, right, but, right. but they tend to do that, and they get extra properties that they wouldn't have had. For example, suppose you take a bunch of water molecules and cool them, and they form a water droplet, and it's round. Okay, it's beautifully round. Now, now it's perfectly round. Now, why did it do that? Well, of course, there are forces and microscopic things in there and so forth. But if it had been cold, it would have been a snowflake, and it wouldn't have been round at all. Mm. Okay, So in either case, either the round raindrop or the six-pointed snowflake, it got a property as the result of the way it organized. Now, why did it do that? Well, um, uh, it just did. <laughs> Well, I, I would think it has something to do with the underlying properties of uh, hydrogen and oxygen and how they interact. And yeah, but I defy you to actually go deductively from the hydrogen and oxygen right, and so right, forth right. to this behavior. Right, sure. Landau used to say, famous physicist Lev Landau, he said, you can calculate the properties of water, he said, but it makes so much more sense to measure them. Oh. <laughs> and And when you do this, the simplicity that you look for is determined by the symmetry, or, or you, you can discern, you can discern the simplicity by seeking the symmetry. Uh, almost. Uh, you guess that the symmetry, the simplicity is there, and then you look for the symmetry okay. as a symptom of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And thank God, nature often does this. So it's a good, it's a good guess, you know. If you find some uh, special, some some shape um, that's um, unusual, there's good reasons to suspect that there's a reason for it. It's telling you something very interesting. Now, what about broken symmetries? What do physicists mean by that? Ah, well, broken symmetry is a very unfortunate term. It's historical, and I guess the simplest answer I could give you is most of the time um, it doesn't actually mean that. Now uh, the canonical example is magnetism. So when a thing becomes magnetic it picks out a direction for the magnetism to be in. Mm -hmm. But The lines of force. That's right. But it does that spontaneously and it could have picked it out this way or this way or this uh. way or this way. It sort of just decides collectively that it's going to be this way. So that's what it means when it broke. Uh, the original equations of motion are perfectly invariant under rotating, but the magnetic state isn't. Now, it turns out, however, historically, the word term broken symmetry has actually not been applied to that problem, but a related one, which is um, superfluidity and crystallization. And there, the um, the it's a little more subtle. Let's say in that case, broken symmetry means something like crystallization, something analogous to crystallization. So, in a crystal, the matter matter crystallizes. The atoms line up here, but they could just as easily have lined up here or lined up here. They decided where mm -hmm. they were going to line up, and they became collectively. Newtonian, that's to say they lost all their quantum properties. When you find one of the atoms here, you can go a thousand atoms away and predict with some certainty that its friend will be there also. Yes. And all there's all the quantum mechanics and uncertainty and, and things being in two places at once and so mm. forth. All the weirdnesses of quantum mechanics disappear. Mm. Well, 
the abstraction of that general behavior is what we call broken symmetry. So these are two different ways of looking at the micro world of physics. Symmetry and broken symmetries give you two, are, are two different approaches. Uh, no, um, no, like I said, this is again an unfortunate historical legacy. Broken symmetry as a practical matter just means a phase transition. It means the matter went from being a fluid to a solid. That's all it means. And, of course, rigidity of solids involves the soldier-like registry of the atoms. Uh, but that's, that's splitting hairs. It's basically a phase transition. Water nice. In any event, the reason that physicists love symmetry so much is that symmetry gets you out of jams experimentally. Yeah. Yeah. And boy, when on a dark night, yeah. when you've got a symmetry on your side, uh, it's a mighty wonderful feeling.